People are largely under the impression that the fight between Hamas and Israel is purely political, but that just isn't the case. If you look at how Hamas has behaved towards those that they've attacked, it's clear that there's a lot more to the story. The amount of hatred and contempt that Hamas has for Jewish people doesn't just come from the living conditions, but more significantly from Islam and the teachings of Muhammad. Here's why. Today, I'm joined by Dr. David Wood. Now, David, there's lots of Muslims that are claiming that they don't have a problem with Jews. The problem is actually with the Zionists. And they point to Quran verses that show that Muhammad didn't hate the Jews. So is this just a political issue? No, this uh, this has got something to do uh, with Islam, I would say. <laughs> but they do have uh, a point when they say that... Um, that there are passages where Muhammad had a favorable view towards the Jews. So, I mean, really running throughout uh, Muhammad's earlier revelations and even some of his uh, some of his later revelations, he really seemed to take the Jews as an authority in matters of religion. And there's it's obvious that even among the polytheists of Arabia, the Jews had some status as people who were uh, they had some special knowledge in religious matters because there are all these appeals saying, ah, but look at the people of the book. Ah, but what about the people of the book? So this would be Jews and Christians. Uh, but lots of times it's the emphasis is on uh, Jews. So, hey, ask the Jews about this. If you doubt Muhammad, ask the Jews. If you don't believe Muhammad, just ask the Jews and so on. So it's they're being presented as some sort of uh, authority in these religious matters. And this is true even for Muhammad, even for Muhammad, uh, the Jews and the Christians were viewed as authorities in matters of religion, so much so that in Surah 10, verse 94, it's not widely known among Muslims now, but Muhammad had all kinds of doubts about his revelations early on. Matter of fact, his first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic in origin. He thought he was demon possessed and he tried to hurl himself off a cliff because he thought he was being... Um, uh, messed with by a demon and he didn't want people making fun of him over this and so uh but uh at one point muhammad's having doubts about his revelations because people are telling him he's crazy and so on. you're just crazy man you're insane anyway surah 10 verse 94 allah says to muhammad says if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you ask those who read the book before you so uh, Muhammad, if you don't think these revelations are true, then go ask the people of the book. So this would have been Jews and Christians. So notice it's uh, Muhammad can only, um, can only have confidence in his revelations if they line up with our revelations. That of course poses a, a massive problem for Islam because our scriptures are given authority over their own scriptures, over Islamic scriptures, right? They can only confirm their scriptures by going to our scriptures and making sure that their scriptures line up with our scriptures. That's kind of a separate issue. The point there is Muhammad is viewing Jews as people who have reliable scripture from God and who can explain the contents of these scriptures and verify uh, with verify whether he's a true prophet or not. Um, so you have the idea that there are authorities in matters of religion. And then even after Muhammad and his companions move from Mecca to Medina, um, Surah 2, verse 190, I mean, uh, uh, Surah, yeah, Surah 2, verse 62, says, Surely those who believe and those who are Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whoever believes in Allah and the last day and does good, they shall have their reward from their Lord, and there is no fear for them, nor shall they grieve. So wonderful verse right there. Hey, if you're, if you, as long as you believe in God, doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Christian, whatever, as long as you believe in God and you do the right thing, you're good to go with Allah. And of course, that's going to, uh, you, you have these kinds of nice teachings, but uh, they're not going to last, let's just say, because what, what, what's really going on, and this happens over and over again, not just with the Jews, but with the Christians as well. What's actually going on is that when Muhammad thinks that the Jews and the Christians are going to agree with him, that he's a prophet, because keep in mind, Muhammad just stands up in Mecca one day and announces that he's a prophet and that he's in the same line of prophets 
uh, as the Jews and the Christian, uh, as the Jewish and Christian prophets are in. And so he thinks he's going to go to them and say, hey, guys, I'm affirming your revelations. I'm affirming uh, the scriptures that you have, and therefore you need to affirm me as a prophet as well. Uh, let's just say the Jews didn't uh, didn't buy it. Neither did the Christians later on. And then Muhammad's positions, well, it might change. Yeah, well, I am happy to see that some Muslims are quoting those positive verses towards the Jews and that sort of thing, too. But that still raises the question of why are Muslims in Australia and around the rest of the world chanting slogans like gas the Jews? And were there also videos of scholars saying that they'll hate the Jews no matter what? Yeah, uh, and that goes back to Islam as well. And so this is just something you find over and over again in the Muslim sources that Muhammad's position on various issues changes over time. And shocker, so do Allah's eternal revelations. They change too whenever Muhammad's feelings happen to change. So um, uh, it, you, we see this all the time, right? Like Muslims will point to verses of the Quran to show that jihad is just defensive. It's just defensive fighting, right? It's, someone else has to start it, right? And they'll say, oh, look, it says right here. It says, you know, fight those who fight you. See, it's self-defense. And they ignore the fact that the Quran is not just, here's a set of teachings and these are all equally binding and equally authoritative and so on. They have a doctrine of abrogation where Allah is changing his revelations over time. And so you can't ignore, like Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Notice that's, that's not fight those who fight you. That was an earlier revelation. Now it's fight those who do not believe in Allah. And so Muhammad's revelations change over time based on his attitude towards the people he's around. And when Muhammad, <clears throat> so there are basically a couple of stages here. At first, when Muhammad is receiving his revelations, he's surrounded by polytheists in Mecca and he's receiving revelations. And if you look at the revelations he receives during this time, the attitude is, hey, it's me and, and my followers, the Muslims, and we're united with Jews and with Christians, and we're all on the same side uh, against polytheists and pagans. And so he thinks it's all the, all the monotheistic groups are united with him. And uh, during, during this time early on, Muslims are actually rooting for the Byzantines, the, so the Christian empire, uh, uh, in their war against, uh, against the Persians. Right, because it's hey, these are the monotheists, and they're fighting a bunch of pagans. We're we're rooting for the monotheists here. So Muhammad believed it was Muslims, Jews, and Christians all on the same side against polytheists. Then the Muslim community moves from Mecca to Medina. Muhammad really thought that the Jews are going to affirm him as a prophet. Long story short, they didn't. They recognized him as the most obvious false prophet in history. I mean, his his defense of his uh of, of the claim that he's a prophet is that Mah that muhammad's in the bible muhammad is in the torah he's he, there are prophecies about him in the torah and the gospel and so uh the question is well where where are you in the torah uh, where are you in the torah and the gospel if you're a jew you're saying okay where are you in the torah and of course it's book of trust me bro right that's that's what it always is he doesn't tell you where he is <laughs> they just say oh yeah i'm in there um, so the Jews reject him as a prophet and they grow in hostility towards him. So he starts getting more hostile towards them and they start becoming more hostile towards him in return. Uh, but basically when Muhammad moves to Medina, there are three large tribes of Jews there. Uh, less than a decade later, there are almost no Jews there. Uh, they were, they're, they're either exiled or they were completely wiped out depending on the situation. Um, but Muhammad's revelations changed over, uh, over time towards the Jews as well. So Surah 5, verse 51, uh, uh, do not take the Jews and the Christians as friends. They are friends of each other. If you take a Jew or a Christian as a friend, then you're one of them. And so you, you, know, you can add Christians to this mix. But so basically, it's when, it's, when he starts off, it's Jews, Christians, Muslims, all united against uh, polytheists. Then the Jews reject him when he goes to Medina. And then it becomes, then you have verses which are along the lines of, yes, yeah, the Jews and the pagans who are bad, but it's Muslims and Christians who are, you know, BFFs forever. Muslims and Christians are united. And uh, let me go ahead and let me go ahead and, and read a verse for you. Um, so Surah 5, verse 82. 
Verily, you will find the strongest among men in enmity to the believers, the Jews and those who are al-Mushrikun. Mushrikun are uh, people who associate partners with Allah, so you can think of them as idolaters or something like that. Uh, and you will find the nearest in love to the believers, those who say, we are Christians. That is because among them are priests and monks, and they are not proud. But notice there, it's the strongest among the strongest in enmity to, mu to Muslims are the polytheists and the Jews, and the friends of Muslims are the Christians. And then, of course, Muhammad finds out that Christians reject him as well. And then, then you get to the final revelations, which is Surah 920, you know, passages like in Surah 929, fight those who do not believe. And he specifically names Jews and Christians as people who have to be uh, violently subjugated. So it, it's, it's just amazing that Allah's eternal revelations, they believe this is the eternal speech of Allah. Everything just changes based on whether people like Muhammad or not and how Muhammad's feelings are hurt or not hurt by, uh, by various groups. And so, but notice right there you have in, in Surah 5, verse 82, this claim that uh, that Jews are the most hostile people along with the idolaters. Jews are the most hostile people. But notice, this is Allah's eternal speech. These are these are becoming the final marching orders. Surah 5 is one of the last uh, one of the last major chapters revealed. But even it's not even if it's not final, you eventually get to Surah 9, and that's where you have these commands to violently subjugate. Uh, Jews and Christians. So I'll just read Surah, uh, interesting passage. Uh, Surah 9, verse 29 and Surah 9, verse 30 go together. But Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his apostle, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay, so that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So this is a command to fight people based on their beliefs, not based on whether they attack uh, Muslims or not. And it's interesting because th since the, the claim there is you have to fight people based on their beliefs, an obvious question that would arise would be, why are you fighting Jews? They believe in God. They, what, what are you talking about? Why, why, why are you attacking them? The very next verse, the Jews call Ezra the son of Allah, and the Christians call Christ the son of Allah. That is a saying from their mouth. In this, they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Now notice there, the justification for violently subjugating the Jews, because again, you're supposed to be fine as long as you believe, remember? As long as you believe in God, you're going to be fine. You believe in God and you do good things, you're, you're going to be fine. Well, no, because he, according to Allah in the Quran, Jews believe that Ezra is the son of Allah. Now, John, if you want to do a fun experiment, go ahead and try to find any Jew anywhere in all of history who said that Ezra is the son of God. Um, Muslims haven't been able to show us even one. And yet, according to the Quran, this is the reason Jews have to be subjugated. They say Ezra is the son of Allah. And notice the parallel. It's Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah. Christians say Jesus is the son of Allah. This is why you have to subjugate. So it's, it's in the same sense where you're committing shirk. You're committing the unpardonable sin by saying this. And this is why Jews have to be violently subjugated. Meanwhile, we can't find a single Jew anywhere in history that's even said this. And so it's really, it's really weird. It looks like either Muhammad was just completely clueless about what Jews believe, or that he's even just making stuff up in order to justify attacking them. So that's how bad things had gotten to where, uh, I want to change what I said about you guys, and now we have to fight you. And, uh, oh, yeah, they, they worship Ezra over there. And Jews are going, what the, what is this guy talking about? Um, but that's what it became. And so Jews had to be violently subjugated and... Uh, so you, you, long story short, by the time you get to the end, it's, uh, it, you've got passages like, uh, uh Surah 98 verse six, which are, that's it. There's nothing that comes after them in toward of, in, in, uh, uh, as far as general attitude towards Jews and Christians, but Surah 98 verse six says that Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures. It says we're the worst of creatures. You got you compare that with Surah 3, verse 110, that says Muslims are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. And then all of this comes together as 
part of the reason that Jews and Christians have to be subjugated, even though we have true revelation from Allah and we're the people of the book, we have to be subjugated because by rejecting Muhammad, we've we've become inferior and can't be trusted with, you know, having authority in a society or anything. And so we have to be subjugated. And so basically Muhammad's relations and view towards Jews throughout his life deteriorated. And keep in mind, we're only talking about the Quran so far. We're only talking about what the Quran says. You go to the Hadith, this his attitude got worse and worse. Uh, in, in Sahih Muslim, Muhammad said, I will expel the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. So by the time he's finished, it's, I want all these people out of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, wasn't a big fan of religious diversity towards towards the end. And so Jews and Christians had to be expelled from the Arabian Peninsula. And then things still got worse as uh, as Muhammad kept having problems with Jews so that he was telling his followers that the end would not come. The judgment would not come. You would not get your virgins until Muslims fight the Jews and kill the Jews to the point where Jews are hiding behind rocks and trees, and even nature itself is helping Muslims exterminate the Jews, uh, to where the rocks and trees are saying, the rocks and trees will speak out, and a rock will say, hey, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come get him, come kill him, and Muslims are running around killing the Jews. And so, yes, you can point to passages in the Quran which say, hey, you know, Jews, Christians, everyone's fine, everyone's fine with, uh, with Allah, as long as you're doing the right thing. Those are not the final revelations those are not the final marching orders uh the final marching orders are when you're in a position and you have the ability then you have to subjugate jews and christians making them acknowledge their inferior status and paying you tribute money in order to acknowledge their inferior status uh, those are the final marching orders though that's the final goal and so you take that those commands and how this is psychologically imprinted on the Muslim community, if Muslims are the best of peoples and Jews are the worst of creatures, should Jews have any sort of political authority over Muslims? No, the answer is no. There's something really off about that, right? Islam is supposed to keep expanding and expanding and expanding and dominating more and more and more until it controls the entire world. And you're, if you're a Muslim, start, I mean, you don't even have to say right now, if you go back, you know, to the previous century or to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, this isn't supposed to happen. Muslims are supposed to keep expanding until they dominate the world. And yet, all of a sudden, Western nations are more powerful than the main Islamic empire. And so what's going on here, it's very confusing. And you've got Muslims who kind of go in two directions. They started going in two directions on this in the 20th century. And one direction was to go, was to say, okay, if Western nations are, are far more powerful than us, then maybe either there's something wrong with, maybe there's something wrong with Islam. Maybe Islam is false something like that, or maybe we just need to modernize and become like the Western nations. And so if you look at pictures of, you know, people in Iran or Afghanistan in like the 1960s and 1970s and so on, for a while, it, it, it they look like Western nations because they were trying, they were trying to modernize, but there's another possible reaction. And the other possible reaction is Allah is allowing these other people to be more powerful than us because we're not doing what, what we're supposed to. We're not living a, how we're supposed to. We're not cracking down on immorality and innovation in our own community. Um, so we, we're supposed to be li living according to fully implemented Sharia. We're supposed to be cracking down on any sort of heresy in our own community. And only then will Allah bless us. So the solution to this problem is to become much more, much more uh, devout in in religion, in matters of religion. And that's what that's when Allah is going to bless you. And so the other direction is like the direction of ISIS and so on, where they like exterminate anyone who's disobedient in the entire community, thinking that Allah is then going to bless them to conquer uh, to conquer the entire world. Um, and you've got the same idea with a group like Hamas. Why aren't they? Um, why aren't they able to conquer the Jews? Well, they mu they must not be doing it right. They must, if they were to cleanse and purify their motivations and so on, then Allah will actually bless them to go and and conquer and wipe out the Jews. So they view the Jews now as a kind of obstacle uh, or a kind of test 
that they have to overcome. And that's why they, that's why it looks like they're just going to keep regrouping and coming uh, at the Jews um, forever. And so it's, it's basically what you have here is, is a, two, it's a, two, there are two problems. So one, it is true in Islam that their Islam calls for the violent subjugation of Jews and Jews are not supposed to have political authority over Muslims. And so you've, you've, you've got this, but at the same time, it is an issue um, that there's a land that was at one point controlled by an Islamic empire and is now controlled by Jews. And there's a, an interesting application of a verse. This verse wasn't, this verse wasn't originally about uh, Israel or Jews, but this is about the polytheists of Mecca. Um, Muslims eventually had to flee the polytheists of Mecca. And then eventually you get a command to fight the polytheists of Mecca because they drove you off land that you controlled. So Surah 2, verse 191, and kill them wherever you find them and drive them out from whence they drew from whence they drove you out. And persecution is severer than slaughter. So the command here is since you were once there and they drove you out, you have to go back and fight them until you drive them out from whence they drove you out. And you've had Muslims over the years that say, no, that, yeah, that was about Mecca, but it's still a principle that applies. If you've been driven off your land, you have to go back and keep fighting until you get that land back because Islam is only supposed to expand. It's never supposed to, uh, supposed to shrink. So on the one hand, yes, there's just this hatred of and hostility towards Jews. But on the other hand, yes, it is an issue that uh, that Jews now control a land that was at one point controlled by Muslims. And so either one of those would be justifications. And so you can have people who say, yes, we're fighting because of this issue. And it's just this issue of Zionism or something like that. That's the problem. No, 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 no. The more accurate position is what you've referred to in some of those videos of the Muslim scholars who will say, yes, we hate you because you what's going on with the Palestinians, but we would hate you anyway. And that's a position that's you found the same thing from ISIS and Al Qaeda uh, statements over the years. Yes, you Westerners, we hate you because of things you've done in the Middle East and so on, uh, but we would hate you anyway. So we, we're going to fight you anyway. Just be clear. We're going to fight you anyway. We're going to try to subjugate you anyway. But yeah, we're, we are upset about this thing that you're doing right now. So, uh, so yes, there, there is a, a bunch of hostility because of the situation with Israel and uh, the, the, the Muslims in the Gaza Strip and so on and, and the West Bank. But there would be, the hostility would be there anyway. And it was there, it was there long before anyone ever heard the word Zionism. Gotcha. And so given what you said, it sounds like it's going to be kind of difficult for them to find peace and move forward together. But how do you think that this conflict could pot potentially end? Well, notice it. I mean, it, it reminds me of a, the PBD podcast very recently where he has on two Muslims and two Christians. And they ask the Muslims, hey, what do you think should happen to these guys? And the Muslims say, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we get control, these other guys are dead. And they're talking about Brother Rashid, who's an ex-Muslim, but they even included people for blasphemy, which would be Robert Spencer. He's guilty of blasphemy. And they said, yes, if we get in control, both you guys are under a death sentence. And then uh, Patrick Pat, Patrick then moves on as, as like, we're going to talk about building bridges and what do we do about LGBTQ stuff? And it's like, wait, if one side wants to exterminate the other side, you got a problem with the bridge building right there. The bridge building, bridge building is... What are, you, what are you talking about? Building bridges, what? So they can throw me off the bridge? What, what in the world are you talking about? Um, but that's kind of a situation when you're thinking about, because notice, I mean, if, you, if you're asking me, I'm thinking in terms of uh, human rights and uh, not oppressing people. And we should, you know, as Christians, we should want what's best for the Muslims and Christians who are in the Gaza Strip um, and who are in the West Bank. We should, we should want what's best for them too, and what's best for the Jews. And so, what's you know what what sort of what sort of possible good outcome could there be here? Notice, as long as as long as one group wants to annihilate the other group, as long as that is the agenda of one group, then either 
either one group exterminates the other or the other one exterminates them, right? That those are the only those are the only possible way for as long as one group wants to exterminate the other, then either they get their way and they exterminate that group or that group exterminates them so that there are no more so that they don't want to exterminate them in either more. Uh, that's one possible way out of it is one group actually does uh, does some exterminating or something. Keep in mind, guys, I'm not advocating that. I'm saying that's what you want to avoid. That's what we try as Christians, especially we would want to avoid one side obliterating the other side. Uh, but the point is, as long as that's the end game, the goal of one side, any sort of conflict where one side wants to completely exterminate the other, it looks like you've got a serious problem there because unless one side does exterminate the other, how does, how does that ever change versus, you know, just going on forever, just be constantly, okay, fighting, losing, regrouping, attacking again, and so on. It's no way to live. Um, and so the only real path to any sort of uh, peace would be dropping the idea that one side has to exterminate the other. But notice that's all tied to Islam. It's all tied to Islam. And it's not, you don't get your virgins until you fight the Jews and kill them to such an extent that they're running and hiding from that. Notice that's not the case. J Jews are Jews are much more powerful there than Muslims are. And so they're supposed to be getting to a place where the Jews are in such terror that they're hiding behind rocks and nature itself is helping Muslims exterminate Jews. You got to drop those kinds of ideas. So what do you do? But notice that comes from Muhammad. And so it looks like it looks like the the only solution, even just in terms of like political peace and people not just being in a state of constant ongoing warfare, uh, looks like people have to drop some of these ideas for Muhammad. And I don't know how to do that apart from exposing Muhammad as a as a false prophet. Agreed. So I guess we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks for joining us, David. And where can people find you and your work? Uh, kind of all over the kind of all over the place. <laughs> um, but uh, hey, yeah, as of right now, yeah, I've got a couple channels uh, posting on Yeah, people can find me pretty easily if they go to YouTube and type in David Wood, they'll get some fun stuff from haters, but they'll also find me. That sounds good. All right. Thanks for joining, man. Appreciate it. Now, if you're interested in following this story, make sure you subscribe because we'll be covering it with more special guests as the story continues to develop. In the meantime, check out this playlist with the other videos that we've done talking about the Israel and Palestine conflict, and I'll see you soon.